So Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now, they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers. You remember that, that God gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, that um, the church at Antioch has this division of labor, it has all of these people f- fulfilling these particular roles. And there's prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While, that's the Apostle Paul. Um, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So just a, a few, a few um, Bible trivia facts. Um, Saul is his Roman name, and Paul is his Hebrew name. I, I believe that it is somewhere in the mythology of Sunday school. His name was changed to Paul. But, it, it, but Roman citizens, many people of that particular time, had multiple names. And uh, so he had a Roman name or a Latin name, and he also had a Hebrew name. He's called Saul in the beginning of Acts, and then they begin to call him Paul in the end of Acts, which I think is a literary device to show the gospel going forth to the Gentile lands, all right? Um, The same thing with Mark. Mark is also John. John's his his, uh, Hebrew name, and Mark is his Latin or Roman name. And so you'll see him called John usually in the beginning of the book of Acts, and then he's called Mark toward the end of the book of Acts. And it's probably a similar kind of thing. As they go off into Gentile lands and the gospel is going forth from Antioch, a Gentile church, they begin to use their Gentile names, their Latin names. Make sense? Another thing you can see real quick right here is that um, church planning should be done under authority. A, uh, a church plant is not something that just an individual just pops up one day and says, you know what, I think I'm going to start a church in my, on my kitchen table. And uh, I'm going to find some fellow disgruntled people to do this with. It's a church plant should be birthed out of a mother church. Make sense? Yeah. And um, this particular church was birthed out of uh, Faith Baptist Church from Virginia. And then we merged with many other churches that were birthed out of other churches. And um, so that's that's how that works. Um, A church plant is not an autonomous venture, but is done under authority. Yes. Yeah, there's a succession, there's a, an umbrella of authority. You can see that the elders of that church are laying their hands on and commissioning Saul and Barnabas to go out to do the work of missionaries and evangelists and church planters. And so um, everyone is under authority. No one is never not under authority. <laughs> um, also, I want to talk about fasting. That's why I want to spend uh, you know, at least 10, 15 minutes talking about fasting. And uh, because you can see right here, let's, let's look at this real carefully, and, and you read it. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to model for you and teach you how to uh, properly apply, apply the scriptures and to meditate on them. So but look right here at, at verse uh, 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Does everyone see that? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. What are some lessons we can gather from right here? Just, let's just meditate on this for a second and think. Like, what, can we, what can we know about fasting? Yeah, I like that. You know, fasting in Scripture is accompanied by guidance. A specific guidance, which you may not necessarily get from a chapter and verse. Would it be nice to be guided occasionally in your career, in a big decision that you have to make? Perhaps in choosing missionaries or church planners or elders? You want some guidance, right? Um, one of the things that you can do is fast. You, know, you can fast for a season of time, even for a day, even for two days, even for one meal, and just set that time apart for prayer and asking the Lord to guide you. you know, who do you marry? Right? Who do you not marry? What career path should I take? Right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Big decisions that you want specific guidance from, 
I believe you should have a season of prayer and fasting so that you can make that decision. Amen? Of course, that's not the only thing you do to be guided by the Spirit. There's other things, but that's one thing. That's one tool in the, in the tool shed. Yes, ma'am? Yes. Sure, Jesus did that. Yes. Yeah, Paul talks about fasting from sex in First uh, Corinthians chapter seven, and so we can imply from that, we can infer from that that you can fast from things other than food. Uh, alcohol would be a good one, especially if you're dealing with drunkenness. Your cell phone would be a good one if you're dealing with pornography addiction. Um, shopping or window shopping or how do you how do women window shop on their phones? Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Amazon, did you say Amazon or Pinterest or whatever? You could fast from that if you're if you're struggling with discontent and you're envious of your of your friends girlfriend's houses. You know you could fasting is and we're going to get to it, but fasting is a, a tool you can use to get guidance. But fasting can also be something. That you, uh, you know, you're asking the Lord for help with a particular sin. And you're uh, worshiping him and offering up that particular time to him as a sacrifice. Um, as a, a moment of worship. And you're praying and, and begging him, help me with this sin. You know, you need a... Uh, that's not the only purpose for it. That's one of the purposes. But um, sometimes if you need power over a particular addiction or a sin, a besetting sin, you need some power, Right? And, uh, and fasting is one of those things I think you, you can do to, to get some power for that. Um, yes, Brother Henry? If you look at one of the things that they talk about screen time, if you spend as much time in the Bible as you do about screen, your life is Amen. I do read my Bible on my screen sometimes, but. <laughs> in the Word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, amen. I think they have some apps that can show you how much time you're on your, your phone. We're definitely all addicted. We're probably slaves to this thing. Not probably. We are. <laughs> Anything else that we can learn from our text here? <laughs> yeah. Paul, Paul doesn't say um, they were fasting, and there's like a little side note. That was something they did back then, you know, you know here, and the, here and there. Uh, fasting is throughout all of Scripture spoken of just like, you know, uh, just normative. They're just talking about it freely. There's no explanation. It's just everybody knows what this is. We do this. We fast. Um, the American church does not fast, by and large, um, for various reasons. And, um, and we don't fast at our church. I don't think it's really one of our customs or cultures. But we need to begin doing that. Amen? We need, we gotta, but we need to learn what it is first. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm wanting to teach you right now about fasting. And there's a lot more to teach, but this is a good introduction to it. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. I like to double the F and the F alliteration. Fasting is focused. Um, what else? What else? Wait, what? Obedience? Yeah. Notice it's go accompanying worshiping the Lord and fasting. Fasting is one of the ways you, you worship the Lord. One of the ways you can worship the Lord. The word worshiping there in the text is the same word that is used um, for the priest offering up a, a sacrifice um, to God. So what I think from that and from other texts is that fasting is, at least in part, you offering up to God a sacrifice. You're like, I'm not going to eat this food. I'm going to give it to you. And in instead, I'm going to seek your face for guidance, and I'm going to worship you and spend time in prayer instead of um, eating this, my this meal myself. So you can, you can offer it up to God, one meal, two meals, you know, a particular thing. Um, I think that's one of the aspects of fasting. Um, does anybody think, is anyone thinking right now, that sounds legalistic? Yes, it, I mean, may, I think that you might could think that that sounds legalistic. I thought it, we're saved by grace, not works. But I think if you've been in this church long enough, you know there's no dichotomy between 
you know, being saved by grace, not works, and also doing good works and offering up ex- accepted sacrifices unto the Lord. Um, they are fasting, and they're not guilty of legalism, right? Um, they're doing something good, and the, and the Lord is blessing them and guiding them in this particular moment. What else? What else can you see? Yeah, to confirm it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I guess so. That's good. What else? Anything else? Yeah, what about it? Yeah, I think, and I think laying on of hands, we might need to do a whole other study on that. I think that that is uh, symbolic of, you know, commissioning them and and sending them off and, and a transferring of authority and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. I think that's what's going on there. But I'm not certain about that. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that is a great point. Notice everyone's doing it together. The whole church is doing it together. That sounds good, right? Could we do that or would we freak out? We can do that. All right, we could do that. Did someone say 100% we could do that? Yeah, we could do that. Um, but I thought we weren't supposed to tell people when we're fasting. It's different? Yeah. Through email, just quietly. <laughs> we just walk, we just pretend like we don't know what's going on around here. Well, if uh, <laughs> you can, there are national fasts in, in biblical history. There's times when, when kings like Jehoshaphat, for example, and Hezekiah call for the entire nation to fast for a particular emergency, for a particular need, and obviously it wasn't a secret fast. I think what, what Jesus is referring to, he's talking to people who are acting like the Pharisees, and, and they, have, they are like addicted to the praises of men, and they are self-righteous. If your besetting sin is self-righteousness, and you're Mr. Religion around here, then we don't want to know about it, okay? Keep your fast to yourself. What, what you're actually fasting from there is the approval of men and the, the eyes of men seeing you doing religious stuff. So if that's you, then you probably need to do some Christian things and don't tell anyone about them, all right? Um, you need to uh, start uh, doing the dishes at church, you know, while everyone's enjoying a picnic, you, you do the dishes and you pick up all the trash and don't let anyone see you doing it. We don't want to know about it. Don't tell us. You know, get your heavenly reward. It, because it's that, that humble service without getting any credit that can uh, mortify pride and self-righteousness. You know what I mean? So I think that's what Jesus is getting at. I don't, I don't think he's, he's um, saying we can't ever have a group fast or a national fast. He's certainly not saying lie to people if they ask you. He's just saying uh, if you are that type of person, you should probably do your good deeds secretly, right? (coughs) Good. (coughs) Yeah, they're not doing it to lose weight. Absolutely. Um, You know, I never, I don't, when I picture the uh, the apostles, so fasting is focused. Is that what you meant by that? Okay. (laughs) He's he's creating like a mystique before it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's not for losing weight. Um, well, you can fast to lose weight, I suppose, intermittent fasting, but that's not a consecrated fast or a holy fast. Um, this would be for a different purpose. And you can, you can tell that because they're, they're praying and they're worshiping along, along with it. So in a, in a group fast like this, would you, would, you would kind of agree we're going to fast for this amount of time, we're going to pray for this particular need. And, uh, and we're going to ask the Lord to help us in this particular way or guide us in this particular way. Make sense? And, uh, and then, maybe, uh, then maybe after the end of the corporate fast, everyone breaks the fast with a feast or something like that. Now, this is historically what churches did, especially during holy days. They, they had it on the calendar. The whole, the whole Western civilization fasted on set, on set times as a, uh, as a particular thing. And so... I don't know. I think uh, I think we should do this. Um, 
we're still, I'm still thinking about how to implement it. Probably start off small, you know, maybe just as a church we can uh, fast from one meal and pray for a particular thing. Or, so we'll think about it. But I just want to chew on it for a little while and, and teach a few things about it. Um, Moses fasted and God guided him. Uh, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, um, the Spirit moves. You see the Spirit moving in several instances in Scripture when the church is praying and fasting, the Spirit moves on a, on a people. That's what happened in the situation with Cornelius uh, when the Spirit was poured out on, on his household. <laughs> uh, perhaps one day when we commission new pastors or new church planners, or elders, that should be accompanied by a season of prayer and fasting, you know, make sure the Lord is guiding us in this particular way. Um, I'm looking at any other things that I have here. <clears throat> All right, good. That's good. Yes, that's a good start. Huh? If it's going to be a corporate fast, it needs to be, yeah, it has to be corporately organized by the leadership of the church. It would be very odd. <laughs> That would be very odd if just some random person was like, you know, made a huge Facebook thing, Christ Church fast days. And I would be like, Pastor Scott, did, did you hear about that? Yeah. I didn't hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, that was a good way to end it. I like it. All right. Great. Uh, <laughs> chapter 13, verse 4. Let's move on. So. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. Notice just real quick, who sent them out? I thought the church sent them out. But here it says the Holy Spirit sent them out. So which is it? It's both. That's right. Um, and that helps you to understand a little bit about what it means to be called or commissioned by the Holy Spirit. A lot of times people like to say, I feel called to this, or I feel called to this, and my ministry is this, but no other Christians agree with them, right? I feel called to prophetic ministry, you know, pointing out the sins of others. Well, you know, none of us think you're gifted at that, so you, you're not called. And so that, there is a two-sided aspect. You can, you can sometimes get a young man who... who uh, is just learning some new theology, he's a little cage stage, and, uh, and he, this is the problem with ignorance, is you don't know what you don't know, and so you really think you know. Um, and so he's ignorant, and he's, and he's blu you know, blustering, and uh, he's called to be a pastor. Well, no, the whole church would need to confirm that calling. Um, so you, you might have an internal call from the Holy Spirit, that's fine, you, that's good, you need that. But there also needs to be a confirmation of that call by your church. Um, you're not an island unto yourself. Make sense? And so that's how, that is how the Holy Spirit would send people out or how the Holy Spirit would call people. Um, from there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John, that's Mark, to assist them. <clears throat> it's good to have friends to assist you, right? You've got to have friends. If you're going to be on mission for the kingdom, you've got to have some people to fight along with you. Amen. And uh, notice also that they, what was their main task? What was their main way of planting churches and spreading the gospel? The main thing they were doing was proclaiming the word. Exactly. It's the word that's powerful, and that's the main thing they were doing. Verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician. That's a, a not rabbit out of a hat kind. That's a sorcerer or a, a warlock or a witch. A certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Pretty cool story, amen? Wow, very powerful. <laughs> Let's talk about demonic influence just a little bit and try to get some principles out of this. 
Um, <coughs> verse 12, in this whole entire passage, it seems to indicate that demons, you know, that's what a sorcerer is. He's demonically empowered. Demons are very often um, um, saddled up beside political leaders. Right. You see what I'm saying there? We have this political leader. He is the governor over the whole island of Cyprus. And he has this worm tongue, this uh, counselor, this demonically possessed counselor who, you know, gives him guidance. And, uh, and, and that just leads me to, to say that Washington, D.C. probably needs a million exorcisms. Um, I mean, our problems aren't just uh, practical and policy-oriented. We, we have a demon problem in our nation and uh, in, our, in the halls of power. And you, we, I would not be surprised if people close to our political leaders literally talk to demons. You know, I would not be surprised by that at all. That has been <laughs> what the devil has been doing a long time. Who was behind the power of Pharaoh and the guidance of Pharaoh? Who was always around Pharaoh? Sorcerers, that's right. You know, necromancers, people who talk to demons. Uh, who was around Darius and around um, Nebuchadnezzar? You know, who were these other people? Remember, Daniel was a wise man, and, and, and he had all these other dream interpreters and what all around him in the court of this king. Who are these people? They're sorcerers. They're witches and warlocks. <laughs> in every culture, you know, every culture, if it's not Christian, it has that. It has that. Demons have uh, regional or they have national power over a particular region through their influence. And so you can see that. Um, and it, it seems that demons like to focus on, on leaders, if you think about that in the, in the Bible, you can think about all the demonic attacks on leaders, you know, national leaders, political leaders, and church leaders as well. Paul and Barnabas are commissioned, and what happens right after that? A demon, a demon, a demon through this sorcerer um, starts coming at them and impeding the preaching of the gospel. Demons take, take note of, of that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> notice also that demons are interested in um, stopping people from hearing the gospel. What's Paul and Barnabas trying to do? They're trying to preach the gospel to this, to this ruler who summoned them, and there's a demon in this guy's ear, you know, contradicting it and stopping it. it you know, and that happens. The, uh, listen to Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Paul says, The ones along the path are those who have heard. Y'all know this parable, right? The gospel is preached, the seed falls along the path. The ones along the, the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. You know, have you ever had a visitor come to church and you know they're not a Christian? And you're like just so, you know, ah, oh, I can't wait. Maybe they're going to hear the gospel and be saved. And then they're just completely distracted the entire time. They hear nothing. They leave and you're like, oh, what, a, what a bummer. All right? That happens all the time. Just the most random of distractions. And they're just out to lunch. They don't even notice. Um, demons do that. They try to snatch away the gospel before it has a chance to, to take root in a person's heart. And that's what this demon is doing to this particular political ruler. All right. um, there, is just a, there is a belief out there, and I think that there's a lot of legitimacy to it, that demons have regional power and regional authority over particular areas. You can see that in Daniel chapter 12, if I remember correctly. Um, and you can see it in other places that there are not only guardian angels for particular people, uh, but there are angels who guard particular regions. And then there are demons that seem to be, you know, a little division of labor there. And uh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, they, and they, they, they influence political rulers and church rulers and powerful people. And they sort of, sort of captivate an area. And so I think it's important if you're going to evangelize an area that you need to have, you need to consider that, right? And you need to go to God to send his angels to fight the demons and send Jesus, ask Jesus to fight the demons to take the blinders off of the political rulers or the regional leaders. That is, I think that that is um, what's going on here to some extent. 
um, history tells us that the gospel spread throughout this island after this. The king becomes a Christian, um, and then the influence spreads all over the island, and the whole region becomes Christian eventually. So I wonder if that could happen here, right? That would be cool. That would be great. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this? Notice, think about this too, um, an Elimas, an Elimas. What is an Elimas? It's a, a sorcerer. But, um, you know, I think that, have you ever had someone who just became a Christian or is just hearing the gospel for the first time, and then there's another person in their life that's really close to them, like a family member or a friend, and they're always trying to get them to not, to not do it, and they're like using emotional terrorism and manipulation and, and name calling to the church. <clears throat> I'm sure some of you, if any of you became Christians recently, you might could picture in your mind the Elimases in your life, right? Um, I've seen that. I've seen that in our church. I've seen people come to the church and they hear in the gospel for the first time. And then, lo and behold, this person who's close to them, a friend, a family member, sometimes a Christian, starts to put poison in their mind to try to get them to divert course. And um, it's just, there are elimases out there, people like that, and you don't listen to them and pray, pray against them and, and ask God to stop that. Make sense? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> and that brings us to the next top topic, imprecation, imprecation. Um, does anybody want to tell me what, what is imprecation or what is an imprecatory psalm? Anyone? Yeah, it's a psalm that David sings or Jesus sings and writes, praying God's curses on enemies. Right? Does that sound loving? <laughs> um, well, you know, David wrote the, the imprecatory psalms largely against Saul and Absalom whom he, bo- he loved both of those people. It's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Um, did Jesus love Judas? It seems in some sense, yeah, right? Um, I don't think it's incompatible with, with love to pray imprecatory prayers or to pray curses on the enemies of God. Um, one of the ways God could answer those sorts of prayers is convert them, Right? Yeah, well, I'd be I'd be happy. That's that's up to him, but you can see that in our in our text. Look at a look at verse um, ten. Look at what Paul says to this uh, counselor. He's, he would be like the equivalent of today. It would be like uh, Doctor Fauci um, or uh, mm, what's that guy Pom- Pompeo. Like big time counselors and administrators around a particular civil leader that have heavy influence. It would be like uh, saying to one of those people, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now, if I were to say that to Mike Pompeo, he's the, the former director of the CIA. Is that who that is? Those of you who follow this more, if I were to say that to him, uh, I think that's definitely true of him. Um, I don't know him personally, obviously. But if I were to say that to him, do you think, generally speaking, Christians would be like, wow, way to go, right? No, most Christians would think that I actually was the one who might be the son of the devil, right? Um, but this is a clear example in Scripture of calling uh, curses down on the enemies of God. You can see it right there. Who is compelling Paul to do this? The Holy Spirit. Plus, Paul's doing it. It's not incompatible with love. It's not incompatible with the gospel. It can't be, because it's being done right here. (laughs) And I think this is one of the tools in the church's toolbox when it comes to fighting wickedness and evil in this world. We should pray that God would defeat his enemies and the enemies of the church and the enemies of the gospel. And that... (laughs) All we're really doing is praying that Jesus would administrate the curses of the covenant. You know, we're, we're just saying, Jesus, take care of your enemies. And we should not only pray those prayers, um, we should sing those particular psalms. And we do sing those psalms to some extent. Um, should we pray these prayers with hate in our heart? Self-righteousness? 
No, we, we pray in it knowing that only by the grace of God do we stand, but we really do want the world to be changed, and we want our people to be saved, and we want Elimases to be defeated, right? So the gospel can go forward, and so we, we should pray for those particular things. Any thoughts, any questions on that? Are we singing any this morning? Psalm 2? Yeah, so we will be singing an imprecatory psalm this morning, Psalm 2, which we've sung many times before, but that's one particular example. Uh, Acts 13, 13, got a few more minutes left. Now Paul and his companions set sail for Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. That's Mark. So John quits. Mark quits. We know a little bit more about this particular thing because it comes up in other parts of the scripture. And I've always, I found it fascinating that someone quitting is in the Bible. Like Mark is one of the authors of scripture. And he uh, was restored to Paul late, 20 years later and became very useful to the gospel. In fact, when everyone had left Paul except Luke, Mark, he says, get Mark. He is still useful to me. Mark had not quit. But earlier in his life, 20 years earlier at this moment, they're on a mission trip. They're going through trial and suffering and affliction and persecution. And one of the key team members quits. Right. What a bummer, right? And that really affects the whole team. It, it, it endangers the whole mission. And, and it's, it upsets Paul and hurts Paul so much that later Mark wants to join with him again and he won't take him. He's like, I can't get out there on another trip and have you quit in the middle of it again. You know, and, and Barnabas, who was, who was Mark's uh, relative, wanted to give him a second chance. And Paul was saying, no, Barnabas is like, let's give him a second chance. He's repented, um, and they get in a fight over it. And Barnabas takes Mark, and they, he goes one way, and Paul goes another way with, uh, I think, Epaphras and some other, other uh, you know, assistants. Uh, ben, did you have a thought or a question? There's, we don't know for certain why. <clears throat> there are several theories. Um, he, he was from a wealthy family. So it might have been just the affliction, just the, how horrible it was. I don't think we realize how horrible it would have been in those days to travel on a ship across the Mediterranean, going to these middle of nowhere cities with no, hardly any money or whatsoever. <clears throat> and so Paul lists the trials. He, he talks about getting flogged, getting stoned, right? He, he says, I, would have been, I was happy and I was trying to be content when I was starving and I had nothing and when I had enough food. I mean, this is a tough trip. It's, it's possible that he just quit because it was too much um, to handle. Other people say that he quit because he couldn't take the cross-cultural missions of going to these Gentiles, that he, he felt more comfortable f- work, focusing on the Jews, right? And he perhaps didn't agree with some of the things that Paul was doing in this Gentile ministry. So some people think it might have had something to do with that. Um, but the word here, the word is, it says that John left, but the word has a connotation of abandoning. He deserted, he abandoned them. <laughs> and the word even has the idea of, of being a, of mutiny, of mutiny. You know, you know what that means? So it's, it could have been, which would explain why Saul was really upset about this and would not let him come back again. It could have been that they were all headed in a direction. Paul was the leader. It was hard, and Mark started fomenting uh, bitterness and and poisoning other people, and eventually he church hopped. It could have been what was happening. You know, bitterness rises up in people's hearts, and they get upset with the leadership, and then they quit. They quit. We call it church hopping, but it's really church quitting. Um, and when things get tough, when things get awkward, when you got to work through stuff, some people just don't want to, don't have the resilience to get through it, and they quit. And uh, and uh, oftentimes quitters like that like to get other people around them to justify their quitting. I mean, that's, I mean, we've all seen that many times. That could have been what was happening with Mark. He could have pulled one of those those moments, and Paul was very hurt about it. Paul was very hurt about it. And, but 20 years later, the good news of the gospel is 20 years later, um, Mark had learned from his lesson 
I mean, you know, you, you, when you fail that, that poorly, it, it can, God can use that in your life. And later on, when everyone else was quitting Saul, Mark didn't quit. I think that's, it's kind of a good redemptive, good redemptive story. But um, we need to, and I, I put this on social media, we need to, um, to not be quitters. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and, and teach our children not to be quitters. Um, because quitting is, generally speaking, shameful. It's shameful. Jesus didn't quit on us. Amen? So what can we do to teach our kids not to be quitters? <coughs> yeah, you be a good model for your children. I like that. Good. Don't quit when, when, when times get tough, when a relationship is hard, or the finances are hard, or, you know, whatever, you know, things aren't going the way you would like them to go. The solution is not quitting on your commitments. Let your yes be yes and your no be no right? That's not easy. It takes resilience, patience, perseverance, but we're not supposed to be quitters. Don't quit your marriage. Amen. Uh, Don't quit your friends. Don't quit your church. Don't quit your job when it gets hard, right? Anything else? What else? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Your, your children are in a, a phase of life where you are, you are supposed to be monitoring. Obviously, you don't give them a job that's impossible. Right? That would be provoking them. You give them jobs that are possible, and you don't let them quit. And you teach them not to, not to quit. They have to stick with their commitments. Right? If they promise to feed the dog, we'll get a dog. I'll be the one to feed it. You make them feed that dog for the next 18 years or however long it is. Right? <laughs> Make the, if they want a new toy and they make a commitment, make them stick to their commitments. Now, this doesn't mean we can't get a, like, you know, go to a different grocery store, right? You don't want to quit Winn-Dixie or whatever. <laughs> you can tell I don't grocery shop much. But, uh, but because we never made a covenant with the grocery store. It's a retail relationship. And it's okay to quit retail relationships when the costs outweigh the benefits. But with your covenants, you can't, you're not supposed to quit your covenants. Yeah, no, it's, it's very hard, and you have to keep going. You don't, don't let them be fourth quarter quitters. Don't quit. Um, <clears throat> good. Good. All right. That's all I have for today. Let's have a great Lord's Day.